if you would please. You might need to stand for this. Can we get some guitar? That's right. You can stand. You guys are like, wait, what is happening? <laughs> you said we're doing the table, right? <laughs> As we come to the table today, I'm quick into the first thought of this. We see Jesus walking into the city with crowds, cheering, chanting, throwing their garments down, throwing their palms down. That's how it starts. The people are in a fever pitch. They're chanting. They're clapping. And then we see the crucifixion. And it gets real quiet. It gets real, real quiet. Up until this point, the Roman account and any other religious text you want to read, this is fact. It's, an histor it's, it's not even up for debate. Every religion agrees with it. Even the secular world agrees with the events that happened. The crowds, the chanting, the joy, the hope, the crucifixion. The Christian, for us, for us believers, if you will, our account of that doesn't stop at the crucifixion. Amen? And so here's the point. We've been talking so much, and it, we, don't want, we don't want to get away from it, but Where are your wells? Where is that chant? You guys noticed it was almost hard to lift our voices as we came to the table? It's like, oh, it's a somber thing. No, it's a violent thing. It is a ruckus chorus thing. Heaven was going nuts. They were cheering too. They got silent too as they watched what was going to happen as well. When we come to the table, we have this tendency, and maybe it's just me, I'll speak up to myself. Maybe it's just me. Am I holy enough to take this yet? At what point and how many times do I have to take the table before I see God move in my life? You know, I'm not wearing a suit today. Maybe I'm not dressed up enough to receive this table or for God to move in my life. What if I had worn jeans? How much should I have prayed this week? How many Bible verses should I have read? How much time did I give enough that I... The audit comes with this table. It's like, oh, so now I'm going to be this way here so that now I can be holy. And here's the point. You're holy now. The work is done. All of Jesus, all of who he is, the complete salvific work is for you, in you, living in you, within us, right now. There's no barrier there. And so when we come to the table, it, there's, there's a tendency, and it is a solemn thing. It, 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 is, it, is, it is something to weep over. It is something to rejoice over. It is something to cheer over. It is violent. It is visceral. It is love. It is passion. It is for us, for his bride, his people, his sons, and his daughters. I want to keep this succinct. As we come to the table today, and we take his body and his blood, we understand that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. That act, that act separates everything that we've known in history. It marks time, A.D., B.C. If that is true, and Jesus is who he said he is, which we know he is, then what he said he did for us is also true. And when we come to the table, there should be an excitement. There should be 
a joy. There should be a grace. There should be a peace. And I understand it because it's silent after the resurrection, after the crucifixion happened. It looked like things were done, like it's not going to change. He's not going to come back. Is this going to happen? Many of us came in here today with questions, with things we're waiting that are in that silent mode. And we're saying, I don't know, God, are you, you going to flip this? Are you going to come back? Are you going to breathe on this? Lord, what about me? Am I acceptable? Am I loved? Am I done? Is it over? His answer is no, because I'm still living in you, and you're still here. And more importantly, you have work to do, because it's not your story, it's mine. And I want to see you, I want to see my glory live through you, so you can give it away. That's what I did this for. You're in my story, not the other way around. And I love you. We get it? Father, as we come to the table today, we just thank you for your salvific work. We thank you for the anthem in heaven that even now goes on as the cloud of witnesses cheer us on, Father. And it's only because of your work, what you did. God, we are so grateful. God, we want to come to you with more joy. We want to, not, not even more, we just want to come to you, Father, and let you have your way in us. As we take the table today, Lord, would it not be routine? Would it not be cracker and juice and words and sit down, Lord? But would we, would we pray? Would, would we have that moment we just say, Lord, I just give this to you. I just, want to, I just want to hear you today. I just want to be with you today. I just want to sit in your atmosphere. I want to be with your brothers and sisters. I want to hear what you have to say, Father. That you would have your way in my life. In, in, these, in these few moments, as we gather on a Sunday, Father. Lord, would it not be routine? We just thank you, God, for your spirit unleashed, your word unleashed, us unencumbered, that you would have full access. We'd get out of the way and allow you to be our God, our Father, the lover of our souls. In your holy name we pray, amen. That was great. Loved it. How about everybody else? Did you enjoy that? It was pretty different, right? I had like that like edgy, like kind of like rock feel, didn't it? Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Well, before we get into the word this morning, a couple of things. Good to see you, my man. Scott Holroyd is back in the house. How are you feeling? Yeah? It's great to great to see you, brother. All right. Love you. Number two, Danny Tapia. How you doing, Dan? Heard a little rumor last night, uh, had some family over, and somebody said that you received an award. Is that right? Harvard University? Has anybody ever heard of Harvard? I don't know if it's a good school. No? So, uh, yeah, so a student recommended uh, Mr. Tapia for this prece uh, prestigious um, award, educator award, so you'll be receiving that soon. A lot of teachers in the room there, so congratulations on that, though. Pretty special. Yeah. Dan, and I heard you're like, you're, you're better than all the guidance counselors at school. Like in terms of, you have a child that's getting ready for college, you want to talk to him, right? Am I correct? I mean, you know everything. So yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a lot. We're, we're proud of you. All right. Last announcement. After the meeting, if you have a child that is in the middle school age area, we're going to have a short meeting. John, Barbara, uh, Morton, and myself, we would just like to talk to you about what we are thinking and what we would really like to do. How many of us know these are the most challenging times for kids, whether you're a middle school kid in elementary school or high school, kids are bombarded with, the, with messages that really are anti-Christian, right? So we need to really prepare them. We need to equip kids, right, so they know and that they can, you know, explain why, you know, they have a reason for why they are Christians, right? So that's something that we're going to be doing after the meeting. So if you're interested, not even if you have a child in that age group, but if you're interested, we'd love to have you and just uh, chat for a few minutes. All right, gentlemen, you can put that up, and if you notice purposely, there is not a title slide, so it's literally like I'm just, I'm going to jump right in, and this is kind of, um, oh, children, are, no, he's staying, kids, uh, teachers and kids, you're leaving, you are staying, yeah, I don't know who's, who's with the kids today, oh, my, thank you, teachers, children, you can make your way out, 
Yeah. I don't know what you're learning about today. You don't get to hear about Isaiah in here. I know you're so jealous. You wanted to hear a message that the prophet Isaiah had for you. How are you? How's everybody in here doing? Can I tell you? There's a heaviness in this room, man. Wow. There's a heaviness in this room. I don't know if you feel it, but I'm just going to pray even before I open up because you're up against it. I can feel it. All right. We're all up against it. There are powers and principalities at work that want to just keep us living here, not having us live in victory. We're singing the songs, but how many of us are really experiencing that and feeling that in our lives? What we've been talking about here for months, right? The normal Christian life, the exchange life, not the change life. You're here this morning. You don't have to muster anything up. You don't have to do anything. There's not a checklist that, you know, I have to check this off. I have to do this. I have to do that. You're here this morning, and you're in the presence of God, and Jesus lives inside of you. His life is your life. And right now, Lord, we just come against the powers and the principalities that would try to just keep us. We come against the enemy and all of his wiles. We come against the darts that he would try to, try to shoot at us. We come against him as he would try to uh, infiltrate our minds. Lord, we know that's where the battleground is. So, Father, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation to see you here this morning. Give us eyes to see. Lord, we don't want information. We want transformation. Help us to see what has already been done. Help us to see that the victory is already ours. We just need to live in it. What is already done? We don't have to, to do more things. We don't have to. It's not behavior modification. Christianity is not a religion. I come against religion right now. I come against against religion in all of its forms for anybody that got out of bed this morning and said, I have to do what religion tells me to do. No, you came to give us a relationship. Lord, help us to feel your power and your presence. Spirit of the living God, have your way in this room right now. Move, move like a fire inside of our hearts. Breathe on us. Do something new, Lord. Continue to do what you've started a while ago. Amen. Hey, sometimes you got to just call out what you feel that's in the room, right? Because that's, that's what we're dealing with. All right, now I'm going to start here with one verse in the book of Isaiah. If you've been a Christian for any period of time, you're probably familiar with this, but even if you're not, so I'm giving you one verse. I'm not giving you the rest of the story yet. It says here in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, I don't think I've ever preached from this before. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died... I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So what is happening right here with this verse? Can I take you inside the year 740 B.C.? Because I know when you woke up and you said, I'm going to church, you were hoping that the pastor, the preacher, would take you inside of this time period, right? Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, of course, right? So it's 740 B.C. It's a very significant time. Why? Because the Jewish people have been divided, right? There are two kingdoms. You have Israel. You have the northern kingdom. Let me just show you on a map. I have to give you the context here before I can really dive into where God kind of led me on accident here. And you have Israel up top, and then you have Judah, which would be the southern kingdom, we are going to be in the southern kingdom here in Judah. This is going to be a watershed moment for the prophet Isaiah, soon to be prophet Isaiah, that we're going to hear about. This is going to be a very interesting time in the history of Judah, again, the southern kingdom. Now, what is going on in Judah when this is happening right here in 740 BC. Let me tell you, very prosperous in this southern kingdom. Everybody is doing pretty well. People are building their homes. They're enjoying life. There's recessionary winds are not blowing like they are today, right? Inflation is not really high like it is today. Everybody is happy. The economy is thriving. Things are moving. Hmm. But... Isaiah wakes up one day, gets out of bed, goes downstairs, 
sits down at the kitchen table and he's ready for some breakfast, Steve. He's ready to have some breakfast. And he gets his bagel and he gets his cup of joe. He gets his coffee, right? Whatever your breakfast is of choice. And he, he looks there on the table. His wife has out. It's the Jerusalem Post. And he opens up the Jerusalem Post and right on the cover are the words in big letters. The headline says, King Uzziah is dead. King Uzziah is dead. He knew that the king was sick. All the people knew that the king was sick. But now the moment has happened where he is passed. He's in disbelief. He's in shock. He can't believe it. He has been the king for 52 years. This is a time in, in the history of the southern kingdom in the time of Israel that you see that this doesn't happen very often that a king is on the throne for this long, this monarch, and things are going pretty well. Here's what it says, and you can look at, you can go to 2 Chronicles 26 if you want to see the whole rest of the story, but I'm just going to give you two little tidbits. It says in 2 Chronicles 26, 4 and 5, and he did, talking about King Uzziah, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord... God made him prosper. How about that? As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. And then it says this in, uh, in, in the next passage in, in verse 15, moving down. And it says, and he made devices in Jerusalem invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread far and wide. Everybody knew who King Uzziah was. Other kingdoms would have known who he was, for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. So this gives you a little context for him, but the one part that you would miss, King Uzziah died, the one part that we don't really see here, but it's very important. You see, at the height of his popularity, he grew very pompous and he grew very arrogant. He went into the temple and he said, I'm going to do what the priests are doing. He, was, he, he said, you know what? I'm impatient. I'm going to take over some of their duties. There's something he wanted to do. And when he went in there and the priests are trying to stop him, God struck him with, let me show you, with leprosy. This is a famous picture painting by Rembrandt. And you, it, you know, maybe hard to see on the screen there, but he's, he's depicting him. It's hard to see with all the light on here. Maybe you want to shut the lights off back there. Maybe you could see it a little bit better. But he gets leprosy. And the last five years in his administration, before he dies, he's in a house, and his son is kind of the public figure that is running, right? That is running the southern kingdom of Judah. Oh, man, how things started out so good, but he became so arrogant in and of himself, and he thought, wow, everything's about me, and how wonderful things are. And spiritually, I didn't tell you on purpose, spiritually at this time in the, in the southern kingdom of Judah, there's a lot of apathy, like there is in the church today. A lot of apathy, and people got complacent. They got complacent with where they were and who God was, 52 really good years. They got so materialistic. They lived lavishly. Life was really good. <laughs> and then it's interesting. Look what it says here. It says that, hmm, the second part, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Hmm, the train of his robe filled the temple. What kind of train? Now, train can be a noun. It can be a verb. Are we talking about Thomas the train here? Is that what we're talking about when it says train? No? Anybody you remember Thomas the train? I still love Thomas the train. I could name all the trains. Henry, James, Scartaloe, right? I'm, I'm still good. I'm still real good. If there was a contest, I would enter. I, I would do well. I would. I would do really well. But anyway, this is not talking about that kind of train. Huh? Is that what you thought when you read it? That's what you thought? Well, it says here, the train of his robe fills the temple. What temple are we talking about? This would be the first temple. This would be Solomon's temple. It's going to come down maybe some 150 plus years later, the children of Israel. But this temple, so he's seeing something. He is seeing a vision. 
just like Paul saw a vision of heaven, and you have Ezekiel saw a vision, and you have the, uh, John, the Apostle John, sees a, has a vision. In, in the book of Revelation, Isaiah sees a vision, and he's trying to describe it and tell the people. But it's during a time when, what? The king has died, and people are wondering, and they're searching, what do we do now? Where do we go? What's going to happen? And the train of his robe filled the temple. And you're going to get the train of his robe filled the temple. Hmm. I was thinking about trains and robes a lot this week. How many of you women had trains on your wedding dresses? You remember the train that you had in your wedding dress? Any of you had really long trains? Yeah, some of you. How many of you haven't looked at your wedding dress since the, the day you got it back from the dry cleaners? Or you don't know where your wedding dress is, maybe. I don't know. I haven't seen your wedding dress since you just made a face at me like you don't know where it, you don't know where it is. I'm going to find that, girl. You want to put the wedding dress? No? What do you do? You just hold on to it forever and nothing? You just preserve it? That's great. Wow, really exciting. We spend all that, right? We spend all that money for the wedding dress for that one day, and then it just rots. Rots in an attic mothballs in a basement somewhere. No one really cares about it anymore, right? You think of, you think of trains, can I, how about this? You ready for this? And this is where I, when, I, when I'm doing, you know, preaching sermons and I, I look into stuff. Larry, you're gonna appreciate this, right? Just pretend, even if you don't. The Guinness Book of World Records for the longest train. You ready for this? Okay, you ready for this? Take a guess. Just take a guess. This, this will be even more fun. How long do you think? Guinness Book of World Records. Don't get your phone out. We live in an age like, you know, don't, don't cheat. What do you think? Just take a guess. How long do you think it was? How long? A couple of years ago, like 2017, this happened. What? 50 feet? 50 feet? What did you just say? See, at least he went big. Go big, Steve, or go home. Six miles, 500 feet. Let's go with 1.8 miles. Whoa! This is a 17-year-old girl that, like, she was the, you know, some model. They were like, hey, we're going to give you a train. They spent months doing this. 1.8 miles! Just kept going and going and going. Who are the people that wanted to do this and break a record? They are the biggest losers I have ever heard of. What a waste of time. The company, the people that are sitting there for months, and they, we're going to do it. We're going to break the record. Yeah, you broke the record. Now what do you get? I, I, like, come on. 1.8 miles. And you know what, I, you know what I, I read this? Just about as high, like 26 plus thousand feet, almost enough to stretch as long as Mount Everest. Really? Pretty crazy. But that's not, when I, getting into robes and trains, can I move you away? I know some of you ladies are super excited. I'm talking about wedding trains and a sermon. But let's move it to robes. Let's move up to what is coming. Let me, let me ask my wife, who loves British culture and history. She wishes she was English. Okay? You wish. Right? You do. What is happening on May 6th? What's, what's happening on May 6th? Tell them. Tell them. They don't all know. Not everybody knows. Do you all know what's happening on May 6th? You all do? My brother-in-law knows. Okay. I, would, I knew it was happening. I didn't know it was May 6th. I knew it was happening at some point in May. All right. Let's put a picture up. There's, there's, there he is. Right? Gosh. I don't want to make this a message about it, but I mean, Megan, what was the joke you told me? The English people, Megan just got back from England, and uh, she said to me, finally, after, you know, how many years did you, I don't know, long time you've wanted to go. Yeah, so I'm in her good graces now, thank gosh. She finally went there, but she said he finally, the, the people say uh, Prince Charles, who's soon to be King Charles, uh, he finally got a job after 75 years, <laughs> right? It's kind of funny. You think of, and but here's the really interesting part. As I'm researching all of this, the robes and the, the crown and the jewels, how much, I mean, incalculable, like how much money all this stuff is really worth. But the robes that, that he is going to wear. But that then brought me back to, hmm, that brought me back to his mom's coronation 
and we'd have to go back to the 1950s, June 3rd, 1953, is the inauguration of Queen Elizabeth II on TV, right? She, pomp and circumstance, and there she is at Westminster Abbey, and there you can see, last year she passed away, what was that, Megan, in September, October of, of this, of 22? I don't know the exact, whatever. It was in the fall of 2022. And she passed away. And what was interesting to me is they actually had that picture that you see there on the left. That is the train that she had, which um, was wild, looking at all the, the intricate embroidery. And it, it, this took them back then. It took months, just like it will for Charles. But this one is really interesting. They had that picture on the left, the, the, the train and everything, all of her, I guess, the crown, the jewels, all that stuff, they had that out on display for people to come see. And I said, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. All the But <laughs> at the end of the day, can I really be honest with you? You look at this and you look at any queen and you look at any king and the robes that they have, whatever the jewels, whatever crowns that they're wearing, they pale in comparison to the one that is talked about in the book of Isaiah that Isaiah the prophet talks about in Isaiah chapter 6. Now before I could even go further and get you really excited, you need to understand when they talked about thrones in, in the ancient world, thrones were very big. They were elaborate. The grandeur of these. Do you ever watch great, a Game of Thrones? Any of you? None of you ever did. Oh, because you're in church right now. You only watch Jesus shows. What do y'all just watch? The Chosen. You don't watch anything else. You read your Bibles all day. You don't listen to any secular music. You're all just super Christians. Okay. Well, if you ever saw the, the, the show Game of Thrones, that would be a really good depiction. How about Lord of the Rings? How about that, right? Tolkien, Christian. Yeah, you're okay with that in church, admitting that. But not Game of Thrones. Well, they were, so they had these very elaborate thrones. And in ancient times, this is pretty cool, when you looked at a monarch's robe, the amount of time that, that went into it, everything was constructed from scratch. So the fibers of, you know, whether it was cotton, linen, or wool, they would have to be spun into thread, and the thread had to be woven into cloth, and the cloth had to be cut and sewn into garments by hand. This is a long, painstaking process by which they did this. Are you following me? I'm going somewhere with this. All right? I'm going somewhere with this. So very time-consuming. Now, this is the most interesting part, and this is the part that I just, as I got into it, I really wasn't planning on preaching this but, like, I don't know, earlier in the week, and then I was talking to Megan about it. I'm like, Megan, do you got to see this? This is crazy. So when kings, when places, when territories, when, when civilizations, when people, when they fought another group of people, this is what they did. Ready? Kings would take the robes from a conquered people. They would take it from the king that they conquered, and they would sew it into their robe. Ooh, ooh, I'm giving you, this is, I'm dropping a bomb on you today. They would take the hem of the, they would cut it off, and they would attach it to their robe. Are you all with me? Are you tracking? So now, imagine what it was like when a king had conquered one group of people, then another group of people, and another group of people, and another group of people, the train of their robe was very long. The longer it was, the more majestic it was, and the more they walked around with their chest puffed out, because look at how great I am, and look at how great our kingdom is. Look at all that we have done. The Bible is amazing. See what I'm telling you? The Bible is not boring. If you think the Bible is boring, you're boring. I'm serious. I'm serious. This is incredible. John tells us, look, John tells us in 1241, he tells us what Isaiah is seeing. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory. And he, Isaiah in 6.1, the one verse I put up for you, he is seeing a vision of Jesus Christ in his glory. And the robe has filled the entire temple. 
C.S. Lewis said this. He said, air is the atmosphere of earth. God's glory is the atmosphere of heaven. How good is that? Isaiah is seeing a picture and he's trying to describe it and use human words just like Paul did, just like John did. And they're trying to describe what is happening. They're giving a picture of what they're seeing. Do you realize And I'm thinking about the Old Testament, right? Can now we move to the New Testament? If the train of his robe filled the temple, think about who we are as Christians and what, what dwells on the inside of us. Look at this. This is in line with what we've been talking about. If you didn't know where I'm going, this is exactly in line with what we've been talking about. Paul says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Church, city on a hill, community church, do you not realize you that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of the living God lives inside of us? Number two, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Church, how are you not jumping out of your seats listening to this? What is he saying? What is, what is this? What is he saying? What does this mean? What is Paul? This means that Every single place that we go, that the sole of our feet, foot, whatever you, however you want to say that, we have victory. Jesus Christ, the train of his robe, Isaiah had a vision and a picture, and it filled the entire temple. It filled all of heaven because there's victory after victory after victory after victory after victory after victory. After victory. You are living in victory, church! We are a victorious people. He's explaining that every single breath we take, every move you make. By the way, that's like a stalker. It sounds like a stalker, by the way. Every move you make, every breath you take, like I'm, I'm watching you, right? But really, at the end of the day, everywhere we go, we have victory. That's what this means. We have Jesus living on the inside of us. The train of his robe filled the entire temple. Do you realize we are the temple of God? The spirit of God lives on the inside of us and we have victory. You have peace. You have joy. You just need to tap into it. The life of Christ is here. You don't have to muster it up. It's already done. I'm going to preach until you get, I'm, I'll preach an hour more if I have to. I'm just going to keep preaching today. I want, us, I, want, I want us to get this on the inside. You know how we're living? Can I, can I give us an, an illustration? Some of us will get this. This is how I feel like we're living. Super Bowl this past year, right? Football illustration. Who won the Super Bowl? Chiefs, Kansas City Chiefs. They beat the Philadelphia Eagles, right? It was a very good game. It was a great game. But you know what I was thinking a lot about this week? I was thinking a lot about when there's a game like that, and I'm just picking the Super Bowl, right? Anytime there's a game like that, they have to make memorabilia for either team. They don't know who's going to win the game. Think about it. Think about it. The game ends, right? And they come out, and the Chiefs, and there's Travis Kelsey, and he's doing his thing, and, he, you know, and there's Mahomes and all these guys, and they're all celebrating, right? If things go a little bit different and the Eagles win, they would have had the hats, and they would have had the shirts, and they got the drip going, and they're moving around, and they're having fun, right? What happens to all of that stuff for the team that doesn't win? And some of you never thought about this before. Yeah, yeah, I th this is the stuff I think about, right? What happens to all of that stuff? Oh, the Eagles lost. Hey, Joe, the Eagle, we lost. Uh, yeah, we got uh, 100 shirts here. We got 100 hats. We got some shoes. We got sweatshirts. We got all this stuff. Let me show you a picture. Let me show you a picture, right? This is a this is Super Bowl champion. That's an Eagle sweatshirt. You want to wear that, right? You'll get beat up at school, right, if you're in Philly. We didn't win. Here's another one. Super Bowl champions. And then I'm thinking, like, where, where does it, honestly, where does this stuff get, is there like an Eskimo in Antarctica right now that's chilling, and he's just kind of hanging out, and he's ice fishing, and he proudly has the Philadelphia Eagles sweatshirt on, and he has no idea that they lost the Super Bowl? 
Are there people somewhere in other countries that have no idea and they're wearing this stuff? Right? Think about it. Church, can I be honest with you? There are so many Christians that are wearing the wrong jerseys and they're wearing the wrong stuff and they don't realize, what am I saying? They don't realize that we already won and we have victory in Jesus Christ and they're walking around wearing shirts that, oh, maybe it was good for them 2,000 years ago. Maybe it was good for them in Jesus' day. Maybe it's good for somebody else, but not for me. Or maybe it's just about forgiveness of sins, and I know where I'm going, but there's no power for me living right now. No, we can live supernatural lives right now. We already won. Take that jersey off. Take it off. Whatever you think of the Eagles, winning or losing. But so many people are just living in bondage. Yeah, right? So many people are just living in bondage. That's what we talk about here. We talk about, we talk about that change comes from the inside out. It's the exchange life. It's the exchange of, it's not trying harder. It's tapping into something that has already been done. Christ's work has already been done. You have as much peace as you're ever going to need. You have as much joy as you're ever going to need. Whatever's going on with your kids, whatever's going on in your marriage, you can tap into another life that can live through you. His life, he wants to live through us. With, there we, we have, an, I just looked at it, we have the sign contend right there. That is our word as a church for 2023. And I love how it has, they did, this is great, how all, the, everybody's word for the year is inside there. Check that out when you leave. We have been saying since last year, and we just chose this as leaders for this year, I know the word contend, the connotation is that you, like it's, you're fighting. And you, no, this is about resting in what's already been done. You can rest in what Christ has already done. You don't have to try harder. Isn't that good news? But here we are. We just keep trying harder. How about this? Let me, let me show you. This is another illustration that is just money. Right? Look what Paul writes in Colossians. I'm just, I'm just going gonna, I'm just gonna to beat this into the ground. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. This is what the message says. I like this too, this version. When you are stuck in your old, sin-dead life, you are incapable of responding to God, God brought you alive right along with Christ. Oh, baby! Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. Think of it! All sins forgiven! The slate wiped clean! That old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross! He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and march them naked through the streets. How good is that? But I need to break this down a little bit. I need to break this down. That word disarmed right there, it's kind of cool when I was researching this. So to disarm is, is literally to strip off one's clothing. Right? So I want you to, and maybe this is a little crude of English. Pastor Linda would never go here, but I'm going to go here. Okay? I'm a little bit younger, so I'm allowed, to, and I'm a teacher in a school, so I've seen this a lot. You know what kids do? Like they'll, like, they'll be working out or whatever. I know none of you young people would ever do this. None of you ever did this before. Jay, do kids at school, they pants each other? Do they pants each other? You know what that is? You don't know what that is? Kids will, kids will, it's true. They literally will, they'll go up from behind, they think it's so funny, it's like a, you know, I don't know, a boy thing, a high school thing, and they pull the shorts down of the other kid. You never got, you never heard of pantsing before? Should I just stop this sermon right now? This illustration is not going the way that I thought it might go. <laughs> Pastor Joe said I did that a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't want that, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. 
I need you to see this, though. I don't know. This is what I thought of when I, when I saw this. He's literally in front of everybody. Do you realize what he's doing to sin, death, hell, and the grave? What he's doing to, to shame and guilt? He literally is exposing them in front of everybody while he's on a cross. It looks like he's losing, but he's disarming everything. And he's showing the world and he's showing the forces of darkness and hell. And Lucifer doesn't understand it. And the, de the demons, they don't get it either. All of his minions, they don't realize what's actually happening. That Jesus is exposing everything while he's on that cross. Gosh, what was happening? He's disarming all of that, you know. And, and oh, here, I gotta, I gotta do, I gotta go into this part too. When it says there, where do I want to take this? Where do I want to take this? Triumphing. How about that? The last part. He made a public spectacle of them. I didn't underline it, but when it says, this is from the New King James, triumphing over them in it. Oh my gosh, this image killed me too. This image is a Roman general that just went off to battle. Picture this. The Roman general is coming back into the town. And as he's riding into the town, he's on his chariot. And he may have some friends, and he may have some family that are with him in the chariot. And all the people, and this is real history, all the people would be there, and they would be yelling, triumph, triumph. And they're yelling, and they're yelling. His defeated enemies would be chained to the chariot, and he would be riding through. Do you realize what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago? When he triumphed, he made a spectacle of death. He made a spectacle of the enemy that he came through in victory. And there is the enemy, and he doesn't realize it, but he's shackled to the chariot. And Jesus is coming through, and he's bringing resurrection life, his life to anybody that wants it for the future moving forward. I don't care if you're all enjoying this sermon, but I'm enjoying preaching it. I'm serious. Living to, just living, as I'm in it all week, I'm like, I'm just so into this. I just, it, it, it helped me. It helped me so much, even just in my own walk. To realize again, to be reminded, church, to be reminded of what has already been done. And I know there are so many frustrated Christians out there. The work has already been done. And you know what we need to get into? We need to get into, right here, right here, victory formation. I never, I never put my title slide at the end. My last slide is the title slide. Do you know when you're playing a, you know when you're playing a sport, a, a football, I'll use football again. At the end of the game, you know one team is going to win, right? And what do they do? All they're going to do is kneel down. The game is over. And they're going to get into victory formation, and the quarterback is going to kneel down, and the game is over. Everyone knows the game is over, but it has not been announced yet that the game is over. I'm here to tell you this morning, death has been defeated. It ultimately, yes, people will still pass on, yes, but it has not been announced yet that death is done, that there'll be no more tears. That day, though, is coming. There's going to be an announcement that comes with all of this. And we can know it, and we can live it, and we can believe it. And we are in Victory Formation Church. We are to be in victory formation and understand that whatever you're up against, his life is living through us. The train of his robe filled the temple, the glory of Jesus. You, he has all the power that you need for whatever situation you're going through here today. That's the message this morning. Lord, Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your people. Lord, help us to really just continue to live in this to live in the finished work. Help us to realize we don't have to be, it's, it's, it's more Christianity is not a religion and it's not about just being a good person. Help us to really see what it's all about. Trusting in another life that lives on the inside of us. Not about a changed life, but a truly an exchange life. Help us to live this out, Father. Spirit of the living God, do what only you can do in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. Father, continue to move on us in this Lenten season. 
even as we get in that devotional and we, we look to you, Father, may we just know you more intimately. May we experience you more. We don't want more information about you. We really want to experience you in this season. Change us, Lord. Change us from the inside out. Amen. All right, church. Next week is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Hopefully you come out. Oh, I got some good, oh, I got some good stuff. All right, have a great week. We'll see you then.